Good afternoon, everybody. I um, want to thank Asaf and the organizers for the invitation to speak and tell you about our research. So uh, for the past several years, um, we've been working on the interface between human genetics, nutrition, and uh, gut bacteria. And I'll tell you about a project that we recently published. So I got interested in this uh, question because of the huge rise in metabolic disease that we've all been witnessing uh, in the past several decades. Uh, probably many, some of you have seen these pictures before of uh, uh, the rise of obesity in the United States in the past uh, several decades. And you can see there are several states that have uh, over 30% of people who have uh, BMI above 30. Um, also the rise of diabetes. Right now, close to 10% of the adult U.S. population are diabetic, another close to 40% are actually pre-diabetic, uh, 86 million people, and this is um, both a, a major risk factor, but also um, a huge financial burden with diabetes alone, costing over $300 billion annually. And uh, I believe that there's been major changes that we've done to our nutrition in the past several decades that have been major drivers of these huge rises in these metabolic disease epidemics. Uh, so one of them has been our decision, uh, not based on scientific evidence, to reduce our intake of fat. Uh, this is a decision that basically led to the food pyramid as we know it today that was taken about 40 years ago. And since protein is relatively stable in a diet, um, if you reduce the intake of fat, you necessarily increase the in intake of carbohydrates, which uh, I, th I believe there's very strong evidence showing that that has underlied rise in um, blood sugar levels and diabetes and other associated diseases. In addition, we've significantly increased our consumption of added sugar to the food. So the average person today consumes in a single day the amount of added sugar as an average person consumed over an entire year just 300 years ago. Um, and we all know the harmful effects that sugar can cause. We've also began to add uh, food additives to our food, most notably artificial sweeteners that most of us use on a daily basis today in diet soda drinks and various other products. We had worked, uh, uh, um, we published work two years ago showing that consumption of artificial sweeteners alters the composition of gut bacteria in a way such that when transferred into mice, it causes the mice to develop symptoms of uh, diabetes. And after our work, there were several large-scale prospective studies done on humans showing that uh, in a dose-dependent relationship, increase of artificial sweetener consumption um, uh, increases uh, various disease risk factors. And finally, since the introduction of electricity about 150 years ago, we began to engage in shift working activities and about 10% of the people engage in it on a chronic uh, uh, daily basis and another 10 or 15% on an uh, occasional basis. We showed uh, several years ago that, um, uh, that uh, changes in um, uh, these life cycle, uh, um, like changing the uh, circadian rhythmicity alters the circadian rhythmicity of the gut bacteria that live within us in a way that also, uh, if you transfer it into mice, you can cause the mice to gain weight and also uh, various symptoms of uh, diabetes. And so uh, these and, and many others, uh, many other changes that uh, I think on average were quite harmful, um, in my view, have really uh, been a driver of the significant rise that we've seen in metabolic disease and therefore, um, since nutrition, nutritional changes have underlied many of these rises in, di in disease, I believe that we can perhaps even reverse much of this epidemic by restoring back healthy nutrition. And this is what got me interested in studying this, and, and we, we took an approach, uh, a data-driven approach, whereby we look at uh, the nutrition, of course, but also the human genome, so the genetics, the lifestyle of people, and also uh, their gut bacteria, which I'll elaborate um, later on in the talk. And when we started this uh, project, we first asked ourselves, what should be a healthy marker of nutrition that we should study? So most studies look at weight gain or um, change in risk of, um, of, of heart disease following some diet. The problem is that these factors uh, take many weeks to change, 
and in the end, you all, and also they're affected by many factors unrelated to diet, and in the end you get a single measure of success, and if it didn't work, it's very hard to understand why. And so uh, instead we searched for a marker that would still be relevant for both weight management and for a diet-related disease, but also one that we could relatively easy and accurately measure across many different, uh, many people. And that led us to focus on blood glucose levels, and more specifically on changes in glucose levels after uh, you eat a meal. So after we, eat our me we, uh, after we eat, our body digests the carbohydrates in the food into simple sugars and releases them into the bloodstream. From there, cells throughout our body, with the help of insulin, uptake, uh, remove the glucose from the blood and so that they can use it as a source of energy. But insulin also signals our body to convert excess sugar into fat and store it, and this is actually one of the primary ways by which we gain weight. And in addition, if uh, we have a fast flow of glucose into the blood, then um, our body can sometimes secrete too much insulin that can lower our glucose levels to even below baseline levels, causing us to feel hungry and eat more. Uh, in addition, uh, many studies have shown that um, uh, glucose uh, levels after a meal are also a risk factor for many diseases, including diabetes, obesity, cardiovascular disease, and, and other metabolic disorders. A recent study that followed over 2,000 people for more than 30 years showed that higher glucose levels after a meal are associated with overall uh, higher mortality. And finally, and not least important, uh, with recent advances in technology, we can now measure a single, uh, we can measure the blood glucose levels of a person continuously for uh, an entire week, and I'll show you um, the data on that uh, in a moment. So um, realizing the importance of blood sugar levels, you can say that what you want one, perhaps one aspect that you would want out of healthy nutrition would be to eat foods that would uh, not spike your glucose levels. But that's easier said than done because prior to our work, there's been small-scale studies done typically on 10 or 20 uh, people on one or two different foods showing that if you give the same people, in this case white bread, the same food, then you can have very large variability in people's response with some people having almost, uh, uh, those on the right having almost no response and others having huge spikes uh, for glucose levels. And, and so when you see this type of data, you also realize that if you want a diet that maintains normal glucose levels, you have to personally tailor that diet to the individual. Um, and that really wa is what led us to go on a, uh, and carry out a very large scale uh, project um, by which now we measured uh, close to 1,000 people and uh, what we did was to connect each person to one of these glucose sensors. So this is a small sensor that attaches to the body and can track the glucose levels every five minutes continuously for an entire week. During that week, people logged everything that they ate and also physical activity and, and, uh, and, 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 um, and, and sleep patterns and everything else that could influence uh, blood gl uh, glucose levels. And they logged that on a mobile app that we developed. And during that week, they followed their normal dietary habits uh, so that they could see which foods spike their glucose, le glucose levels and which uh, do not, except in the morning where we provided the breakfast, very simple breakfast, so that we could standardize across people. And um, in parallel to these measurements, we also collected a very comprehensive profile from people that we thought could explain uh, the anticipated personalized differences in people's glucose response to meals. And that included uh, basic metrics and lifestyle factors like uh, age, weight, height, and physical activity, but also blood tests, medical background and food frequency questionnaires, and uh, sequencing of both the human genome and the gut bacterial composition of people. And of these, the uh, gut bacteria was perhaps the most novel factor that we examined. So for hundreds of years, we know that bacteria live within our body, but only with recent advances in, in DNA sequencing could we begin to study them extensively. And when we did, we found that this vast collection of hundreds of different bacterial species that each of us hosts actually have a very important role in our health and disease. So um, 
uh, and, and what it makes actually the microbiome even more exciting is its therapeutic potential because we can also change uh, the microbiome unlike our genetics even by simple means of changing what we eat. Um, so our bacteria actually process and digest some of the food that we eat and in turn they produce molecules that are taken by our own cells and affect our physiology. And uh, for example, I mentioned several researchers that, uh, research studies that we did, for example, on artificial sweeteners, showing that consuming them can, um, can actually cause symptoms of uh, diabetes. And, and this and uh, many other studies performed, some by us and many by uh, others in the community, have led us to ask whether the composition of gut bacteria could also explain personalized differences in uh, people's glucose response to food. And so we integrated that um, as well as uh, all the other data in terms of numbers. Um, the main results I'll show you were on a cohort of 800 people measuring the response to close to 50,000 meals, logging uh, close to 10 million calories altogether with over 5,000 meals that we provided to people and measured. And we had uh, over a million and a half glucose measurements from uh, this entire cohort and over 1,000 samples of gut bacteria that uh, we analyzed. So just to give you a glimpse of what the data looks like at the top, you can see the glucose levels of uh, one participant in the study uh, tracked every five minutes for seven days. You can see where the participant uh, also logged sleep. And zooming in at the bottom, you can see that uh, when this participant reported eating a meal, that's when we see the glucose levels rise. And we can take the area under the glucose curve as one single quantitative measure of the effect of that uh, specific meal on the glucose levels. And that's what we'll uh, examine and try to, uh, to explain. Uh, in terms of the cohort, it was quite representative of the adult Israeli population. So the age was relatively uniform across uh, ages uh, 20 to 50 to 70. You can see that at the bottom. Um, in terms of um, BMI, so b over 50% of the people were overweight, over 20% with BMI above 30. Hemoglobin A1C, which is a marker of diabetes. We specifically excluded diabetics, so, uh, but we still had over 20% in the pre-diabetic state, which is roughly what exists in the adult uh, Israeli population. And uh, the first thing we examined is also the clinical relevance of these meal glucose responses. So you can see here a sorting of all individuals by the median response to all uh, meals that they ate. So at the top is actually all 50,000 meals plotted. And you can see that when we sort that, all the individuals by their median glucose response to a meal, we see a very significant correlation with uh, factors for that, uh, that conferred risk for disease like BMI, hemoglobin A1C, this marker of diabetes, and also age and fasting glucose. And what's interesting is that these correlations persist not just at the very extremes, but uh, actually they persist across the entire range, meaning that even people who are in the normal range but um, are higher up are, have a higher uh, disease risk factor. So this uh, attests to the clinical relevance of um, of, of, these, uh, of these measurements. And the first question that we asked is on a larger scale than what I showed you before, is we examined the variability in people's glucose response to meals. And, and the cleanest way in which we did that was uh, to look at the standardized meals, the standardized breakfast that we actually uh, provided to people. And these were very basic meals, either bread, bread with butter, or uh, just glucose. Uh, each of these meals we gave twice to each participant so that we would have a replicate. And, um, and what we saw is uh, that basically when the same person consumes the same meal on two different days, the response is very highly reproducible. However, when different people consume the same meal that we provided, the responses are very different. In fact, the variability in every single food that we tested was all over the place with, uh, you can see here in the histograms for all of these um, uh, uh, test meals that we provided, you can see that some individuals, when you give them bread, they almost have uh, uh, no responses, but then others have uh, very large responses. And uh, on the right is anecdotally for four of the participants, you can see, again, the one at the bottom, very reproducible responses, but very low response. 
and at the top uh, individual who responds also very reproducibly but very high to consumption of the same uh, white bread. Now, it wasn't just about how good the body was handling glucose. In other words, it wasn't that the variability was only that some people responded highly to any food that you gave them, but uh, actually there was variability that varied by the actual food. So here is a plot of the same underlying data of the same test meals, but now we normalize the response of each participant to himself. And what you can see here is that we get this clustering in which 60% roughly of the people respond most highly to glucose out of these three meal challenges, about 30% most highly to bread, and only 10% most highly to bread and butter out of these three meals. So in other words, adding fat to the meal for 90% of the people actually improved their uh, glucose response. But you can see the individuality and you can see that uh, we find individuals that actually even have opposite responses. For example, the participant at the top responding more highly to glucose than to bread, but the one at the bottom exhibiting uh, very opposite, exactly opposite responses. So seeing this large variability, this was actually the, perhaps the first key finding uh, of the study done on a, on a large scale of close to 1,000 people. But then seeing this variability, our next question was whether all of these parameters, all this comprehensive profile that I mentioned, whether that was associated with the variability in people's glucose response. And so as a first step, we performed just basic statistical associations between all the parameters that we collected and uh, variability in glucose responses. And we found that for all the parameters in the profile that we collected, there were significant associations. For example, on your left, you can see associations with various um, uh, markers in the blood, uh, then with various uh, um, weight and so on uh, measurements. But then uh, we saw many, many associations with the composition of gut bacteria in people. In other words, people who had specifically, uh, were specifically enriched for certain compositions of particular species or even metabolic pathways represented by the uh, bacteria uh, tended to have higher or lower, depending on the association, responses to uh, these specific meal challenges. Kind of as, just as uh, one example to, to illustrate, uh, what is highlighted here is a, uh, in a significant association that uh, we found between uh, people who respond highly to actually any one of these different meal challenges and the amount of ABC transporters that uh, they actually have represented in their bacterial composition. And incidentally, for example, for this association, in independent studies not done by us, it was so shown that individuals who are enriched with this particular uh, metabolic pathway are actually uh, uh, tend to have type 2 diabetes and it's also been associated with consumption of a Western high fat, uh, high sugar diet. And so our next step was to ask whether we can take all of these associations and, and put them together into a machine learning algorithm that would predict personalized glucose responses to meals. And before I show you our approach and, and the results, I'll, I'll show you what the state of the art is. So state of the art is to use the amount of carbohydrates in the meal to predict the glucose response. And in our data, it's actually very statistically significant. There's a correlation of 0.38 explaining about 15% of uh, the variability. But if you look at this uh, dot plot, probably many of you would not want to choose your meals based on the quality of this predictor. But you should know that actually, uh, if you are a type one diabetic, then uh, you are making, on a daily basis, clinical decisions based on the quality of the predictor, such as dis determining how much insulin to inject following meals. So this is the state of the art today. And uh, what we wanted to do is to uh, take a standard machine learning approach that I don't have to explain uh, to this audience. So basically, uh, uh, initially, we did a, a leave one out cross-validation, so we took 700 99 people uh, used all of their data, developed a predictor. The predictor was a gradient uh, boosting uh, predictor, so a collection of about 4,000 different uh, very deep uh, decision trees. And then we applied the predictor that was learned to the held out data of that one individual and repeated that process for all 800 uh, people. And when we did that, 
uh, uh, okay, before that, actually, what were the features? So the features were essentially all of the features that we collected. So uh, we had many different features coming from the microbiome. These included abundances of various bacteria, metabolic pathways, uh, and, and so on, many uh, features that we could extract from that. Uh, from the roughly 50,000 meals that we had, people actually selected these meals from a database with full nutritional value. So we actually had uh, many features related to the macro and micronutrients uh, of the meals that we could uh, use as features. Then we had contextual features. So uh, people logged also the times of the meals, uh, what they had, uh, we could use what they had in the previous meal, when they exercised, the intensity of the exercise. Uh, about half of the cohort was also connected to a Fitbit. Um, so we could use all of, these, uh, all of these parameters, which also played a key role. And finally, of course, the parameters coming from the blood and uh, the various uh, roughly 200 parameters coming from questionnaires that uh, people filled out. So we integrated uh, all, of these, um, all of these different features. Uh, the final model used roughly 150 features after some uh, feature selection. And the results you can see here, so these are the results of the uh, uh, leave one out cross-validation on the 800-person cohort. And you can see very significant improvement in, uh, the, in the correlation, um, roughly explaining uh, close to 50% of the underlying variability. Uh, and I also remind you that I showed you before when the same person consumes the same meal on two different days, the correlation is roughly 0.7 or 0.75. So in fact, these results are beginning to approach what may be considered as an upper bound for human physiology of reproducibility across uh, different days for the same person on the same meal. Now after completing this analysis on 800 people, we collected a new cohort uh, of 100 people and used the algorithm developed on the 800 people to predict um, the data for the new, uh, new cohort of 100 uh, people. And we were very happy to see that the results and the accuracy were uh, pretty much the same as on the original cohort, uh, uh, the cross-validation cohort um, that the model was uh, trained on. And so um, seeing this uh, relatively high accuracy of the predictor, um, or okay, actually before that, let me uh, tell you a bit, a bit uh, about introspection of the model. So we looked at uh, different features. We did that by looking at partial dependency plots, and we could see the various features that are actually contributing to uh, the prediction, not surprisingly, the amount of carbohydrates uh, in the meal are perhaps the most, uh, as a single feature, the most uh, dominant feature. And you can see that on average, more carbohydrates in the meal predict a higher uh, glucose response. Oh, wow, okay. Um, uh, fat, uh, more fat in the meal predicted uh, an overall lower uh, glucose response. And then all the various uh, features related to, uh, to the meal and to microbiome made uh, contributions. This is all in our published work, so I invite you to read that. And since I have two minutes, let me just tell you about the final step that we did in the study, which, which was to take this algorithm and perform a dietary intervention, which we hoped would normalize glucose levels in uh, individuals. So what we did was to recruit 25 new participants, and for each of them we designed two diets. One that the algorithm predicted would uh, normalize their glucose levels, and another that the algorithm predicted would spike their glucose levels. The diets were personally tailored to the individual based on profiling of the gut bacteria and other clinical data. And the diets, by design, had to be identical in their amount of calories. So since we don't have time, I, I'll just show you, for example, here are two diets for one participant. And um, the diet on the right was actually the diet that the algorithm predicted would be the good one. For this participant, the one on the left was predicted to be the bad diet. And the following re result is, is um, the most striking, in our view, coming out of the study, which is continuous glucose profiling of that, that participant that received these two diets across the entire week. In red, you can see the participant eating the same amount of calories as on uh, the good week, which is in green. You can see in red, uh, very large spikes in glucose levels. In fact, this participant reaching abnormal pre-diabetic levels. But on the good diet week, the diet that includes uh, the ice cream and so on, uh, 
uh, we achieve full normalization of glucose levels in this uh, pre-diabetic participant. And um, here's another diet of another individual, qualitatively very similar results. And, and overall, across uh, most of the participants, we saw uh, very large statistically significant differences between the glucose responses on what the algorithm predicted to be the bad diet compared to uh, the good diet, the bad diet eliciting much higher responses. And we're now in the phase of um, beginning a larger, uh, a longer term uh, clinical study in which we will uh, provide personally tailored diets both to pre-diabetics and also to diabetics and follow people for six and even 12 months to see if uh, what we see here in a week could also even reverse uh, their conditions. And um, finally, I'll just mention that we also tracked the gut bacteria of the people. And even in this uh, one week of dietary intervention, we could see consistent changes in gut bacteria of people, which judging by what is known about these bacteria in the literature were actually beneficial changes because bacteria that on average increased in people following the good diet intervention were uh, what may be considered as good bacteria because, for example, we find them to be um, quite low in, peop in uh, people with type 2 diabetes or we find them uh, to be high in people with improved uh, glucose tolerance. So with that, uh, let me just summarize. I told you about a, a, a large-scale study on personalized nutrition that we carried out. Uh, where the first key finding was that we observed very large variability in people's glucose response to meals. I showed you that by integrating various features, uh, personal features, including gut bacteria and other clinical data, we could devise a machine learning algorithm that with very high accuracy predicted personalized glucose responses to meal, and that we could take that to a short-term, one-week dietary intervention uh, and successfully normalize glucose levels across uh, many participants, even some uh, pre-diabetics. So with that, I'll just uh, put um, the acknowledgement slide. Uh, this was a very large project carried out um, in joint collaboration with the lab of Eran Elinav, also from the Weizmann Institute, and many uh, students and postdocs and researchers from our two labs uh, contributing greatly to this work. And we're also done in collaboration with uh, uh, Zamir Halperin in Ichilov, and with that, uh, thank you for your attention.